to the Explores, time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. Before we get started, I have something exciting to tell you. The Explores shop is officially open for business. It's full of greeting cards and art prints designed by yours truly, all featuring the women we've been meeting this season, and the lady-centric timelines and maps we've created. All perfect for gifting your favorite teacher, delighting your friends, or hanging up on your favorite wall. Spread your love of women's history and help keep the podcast going. To check it out, jump on Etsy and look up The Explores, or go to my website and click on Merchandise. I hope you love what we've made as much as I do. When it comes to the words that made it through time to us, ancient Greece is particularly loud with men's voices. But if you listen, you'll hear one woman in the crowd. We still hear her today, thousands of years after she lived. Heralded as a genius in her time, she was called the Poetess and the Tenth Muse. People made coins with her face on them and created honorary statues of her all over Greece. Even Aristotle, that grumpy bastard, wrote she was honored even though she was a woman. And that's because Sappho wrote poetry that rocked the ancient world. In our century, she's heralded as one of the earliest same-sex love advocates, boldly writing about lesbian desire. It's from her home island of Lesbos that we get the word lesbian. But when you look for the woman behind the name, she turns into one of those Victorian-era shadow portraits. No individual features, just an outline filled in with a whole lot of black. Who was this mysterious woman poet? What did it mean in her time to write about same-sex relationships? And what did it mean to be in one? Grab your lyre, a flower crown, an open mind, and your fanciest quill. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout-out to some of my patrons. My pirate queens, Mikkel, Jackie, Anna, Wendy, Kayla, Jessica B., and Emily. My lady presidents, Caroline, Caitlin, Louisa, Lindsay, Amy, Brendan, Paul, Elizabeth G., Nancy, Eve, Kate, Claire K., Courtney, Casey, Jordan, Debbie, Pamela, Sasha, Cassie, Townsend, Alexis, Ellie, Jessica S., Meg, Edie, Audrey, Lauren, Karen R., Dana, Lori, Larissa, Belinda, Nicole, Claire S., and Elizabeth M. And here's to the gods and goddesses divine who are contributing more each month than I've asked for. Jackie C., Karen C., and Avery. By becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month, you get access to exclusive bonus episodes, sneak peeks, and more. And help me keep the Explores going. To check it out, head to my website and click on Become a Patron. I'd love to see you there. If you're thinking this episode might be just the thing for your family road trip, be warned. We're about to sail through some pretty racy waters that may not be suited for tiny ears. Sappho is born somewhere around 630 BCE on the Greek island of Lesbos, not so far from modern-day Turkey, and lives most of her life in the island's main city of Mytilene, or perhaps Aresos. She's surrounded by hot sun, sparkling blue sea, craggy fields, and a flowering culture that seems to have more room for female intellectuals than on the mainland. But it's also a place full of clan rivalries and drama. We think she's exiled at least once to Sicily for having political views that ruffle one too many feathers. If her poetry is anything to go by, we think she had several brothers. In Herodotus's histories, we get a reference to one of them, a charming sailor named Charaxus, who pays quite a large sum to buy his favorite hetera, named Rhodopis, down in Egypt. Herodotus says that Sappho later writes a poem publicly rebuking Rhodopis for stealing his money and her brother for buying himself such an expensive lady. Ooh, burn! You'd guess that, given her career path, she must be brought up by some fairly progressive parents, but she's probably subject to many of the same restraints as other Greek women. 
the pressure to focus on domestic tasks, not to mention marrying young. But from what we know, it seems like the island of Lesbos may give their ladies a bit more room to move, which probably helps, as does her family's fairly lofty status. Growing up, we assume she gets some lessons in music, or at the very least a chance to pursue her own study of it. It turns out she's got quite the way with a lyre. But to become the poetess, revered and respected as an artist, she must be some kind of force to be reckoned with. Like the majority of ancient women, we don't know what she looks like. Thankfully, ancient men just love rating ladies on the prettiness scale and telling us all about it. But we have a few contradicting reports. Plato says she's beautiful. A literary papyrus from long after she lives describes her as Pantalos Micra, or quite tiny. Another guy describes her as Very ugly, being short and swarthy. But my favorite description comes from Alcaeus, another famous poet from Lesbos. Violet-crowned, pure, sweetly smiling Sappho. What goes on behind that sweet smile, we can only guess. As she gets older, we think she might run a school for girls. Emphasis on, we think she might. It may just be that she keeps a girl posse around her. Women she's tutoring, say, or a group that's some mixture of Sappho fan club and intellectual collective. She might even get married. If her poetry can be believed, she might also have a daughter named Cleese. So, a lot of question marks. But when it comes to her work, we know a little bit more. In ancient Greece, you have a few kinds of writing. Plays, verses meant to be recited out loud. Elegies, usually accompanied by a flute, and epic poems like the Iliad. And then there's lyric poetry. The lyric poetry of Sappho's day is not the kind you still have nightmares about, recited in the slow droning voice of your high school English teacher. Unless I was your English teacher, in which case everything was interesting and glorious. Instead, they're crooned out as melee, or songs, set to a specific meter and paired with a tune on the lyre. They're performed at public events and private dinners, either by a solo performer or a chorus. So instead of Bonnie Vare playing through speakers at your dinner party, you'd have a live chorus plucking its strings. Sappho writes in several different meters, but she isn't just copying what all those emo poet boys are doing. Instead, she goes ahead and invents an entirely new kind of meter, called the sapphic meter, with three lines of 11 beats and a final line of five. She's also said to invent a particular kind of lyre and the plectrum, a kind of string pick. No big deal. Her work is wildly popular, spread across the Greek world by the musicians who learn and perform it. A writer named Strobias tells us that Solon of Athens is so thrilled with one of Sappho's compilations that he asked the musician to teach it to him. When someone asks why, he says, So that I may learn it, then die. And apparently this guy was not one to cry over cute Super Bowl commercials, so this counts as major praise indeed. Her work is so famous that people use phrases she coins in everyday conversation, just like we use Shakespeareisms today. Where Mr. William gave us catchy turns of phrase like Mum's the word and Neither here nor there Sappho gifted the ancients with new ways of describing beauty. Phrases like Love that loosener of limbs and More golden than gold Given how much we talk about her, you'd think that Sappho is the only female poet in ancient Greece. But there are others. Antipater of Thessalonica gives us a list of nine Grecian female lyric poets. Let's let him introduce them to us. These are the divinely tongued women who were reared on the hymns of Helicon and the Pyrian rock of the Macedon. Praxilla, Moiro, Anait, the female Homer, Sappho, the ornament of the fair tressed lesbian women, Arena, renowned Telesila, and you, Corina who sang of Athena's martial shield, Gnosis the maiden-throated, and Myrtis the sweet-voiced, all of them fashioners of the everlasting page. Nine muses great Oranus bore, nine likewise Gaia, to be a joy undying for mortals. I don't think Sappho will mind if we take a few minutes to meet a few of these ladies. One of the major names on Antipater's list is renowned Telesilla of Argos. 
As a 5th century youth, she was often quite sickly, so she prayed to the gods for guidance. They told her that to get well, she should devote herself to the muses. And so, much like many a 19th century invalid who found themselves miraculously healed by spirits, she gets well as soon as, you know, she has something to do other than wait by her hearth to get married. Much like Sappho, she pioneers a new poetic meter, called the Telesilian meter. And though only a few of her lines have trickled down to us, she's influential enough to be mentioned by such literary greats as Pausanias, Plutarch, Athenaeus, and others. And in the midst of writing furiously and being rather famous, she also helps defend Argos against the Spartans in 494. After the Spartan king burns many of her kinsmen alive as they hide in a local sanctuary, classy, she puts down her quill, says, not on my watch, and mobilizes the women, children, and elderly left behind in the city to fend the invaders right off. With Telesila as general, Plutarch tells us, they took up arms and made their defense by manning the walls around the city, and the enemy was amazed. But did this for sure happen? Scholars can't decide, but I love the image of a poetess picking up her spear and showing those Spartans how a battle is won. And then there's Anyate of Tegea, who Antipater calls the female Homer. We actually have more of her work in hand than we do of Sappho's. This 3rd century poetess was one of the first to focus in on the natural world rather than devoting her work to the godly realm, and also one of the first to write the epigram, a pithy saying meant to be clever, amusing, and often sarcastic. Some of her most famous work was in the realm of epitaphs, which it seems many people were eager to have her write. Here's a touching one about a boy who dies in battle. The earth of Lydia holds Amentor, Philip's son. He gained many things in iron battle. No sickness led him to the house of night. He died holding his round shield before his friend. She's especially good at memorializing pets, like in this one she wrote for someone's beloved dog. You died, Mera, near your many-rooted home at Locri, swiftest of noise-loving hounds. A spotted-throated viper darted his cruel venom into your light-moving limbs. Give me one of those instead of a cross-stitch of my dearly departed pet any day. And then there's Philanus of Samos, who's a very different ball of authorial wax, but whose writing is pretty poignant to this episode's subject matter. This 4th century courtesan becomes quite famous for writing a sex manual covering everything from lesbian sex positions to the proper etiquette for courting, regardless of the object of your affection is same sex or opposite. I wish I could quote you what's likely to be some real gems, but alas, her work hasn't made it down to us. We only know about it because of what other writers have said. We know almost nothing about her. What intel we do have was found in the ancient Egyptian city of Ori Rinchis, which translates to the city of the sharp-nosed fish. Sounds fragrant? About all we know is that she comes from the island of Samos. But given that her name is the diminutive form of Philena, the feminine term of philos or love, we think she was probably writing under a pen name. Archaeologists, get busy. I need this racy read. ASAP. Are you surprised by how many poetesses there are floating about the place? Perhaps we shouldn't be, given that so much of creativity is linked with women. The muses, the gods who watch over the arts, science, literature, and anything requiring creative thought, are all women. Greek philosophers may not praise their wives over their cooking, but they do pray to the muses when they want to sit down and pen something magnificent. So, given that Sappho isn't the only lady writer about the place, what is it that the ancients are so obsessed with? And what can her work tell us about the woman she was? Here's a quick ex-English teacher disclaimer. We have to be careful about reading a woman's poetry and judging it as her personal truth. Author and narrator aren't the same person. Just because someone writes about serial killers, it doesn't mean that they are one. Know what I'm saying? But the thing that makes her poetry so special is that it's refreshingly intimate for her era. Personal in a way that little ancient poetry is. It makes it tough not to insert the poetess into her creations. Many of her poems deal with love, and the object of that love is often another woman. 
In this work, which we now call I Have Not Had One Word From Her, translated by Daniel Mendelssohn, we see that Sappho knows what it means to wait for a text from her latest crush. I have not had one word from her. Frankly, I wish I were dead. When she left, she wept a great deal. She said to me, This parting must be endured, Sappho. I go unwillingly. I said go and be happy, but remember, you know well whom you leave shackled by love. If you forget me, think of our gifts to Aphrodite and all the loveliness that we shared. All the violet tiaras, braided rosebuds, dill and crocus twined around your young neck. Myrrh poured on your head and on soft mats girls with all that they most wished for beside them. While no voices chanted, choruses without ours, no woodlot bloomed in spring without song. Woof! Hurry back, anonymous girlfriend. There is some serious romance happening. Most of her poetry has come to us in fragments. In this one, she reminds us how difficult it can be to breathe when someone beautiful walks into the room. Your beguiling laughter. Oh, it makes my panicked heart go fluttering in my chest. For the moment I catch sight of you, there's no speech left in me. But tongues gag. All at once a faint fever courses down beneath the skin. Eyes no longer capable of sight, a thrumming in the ears. And sweat drips down my body. And the shakes lay siege to me all over. And I'm greener than grass. I'm just a little short of dying. Most are just tantalizing snippets of her complete poems, but they give us a sense that she has a deep understanding of love and longing. Here's another. You came. I yearned for you. And you cooled my senses that burned with desire. And another. Love shook my senses like wind crashing on mountain oaks. And then there's this one, where we see the word bittersweet applied to an emotion for the first time we know of in Western lit. Once again, love, that loosener of limbs, bittersweet and inescapable, crawling thing, seizes me. So is Sappho what we modern-day listeners would consider a lesbian? What does it mean to be gay in ancient Greece? When we talk about ancient world homosexuality, things can get confusing for the time traveler quite quickly. Our modern labels and framework for understanding sex and gender aren't the same ones the ancients are working with. Though the word homosexual has Latin roots, homos meaning same, the word doesn't show up in writing until the 1880s. The word lesbian isn't coined until the Victorian age. If you throw such words at the ancient Greeks, they're just going to blink at you. Even if you explain what they mean in our century, they're unlikely to understand what you're going on about, because they perceive sex as an act, not as an identity or orientation, and rather as a passing state of being than as a permanent way of life. So to understand same-sex love in ancient Greece, we have to try and understand how they think about love, sex, and marriage. First, let's talk about love. The ancient Greeks see four different kinds. There's agape, a selfless love, like a kind of charity, that we should aim to extend to everyone. Then there's storge, a kind of familial love that comes from familiarity or dependency. There's philia, a highly connected state of love between comrades. Philia is about loyalty, deep emotion, and communion. And then there's eros, a sexual or lusty love, which is seen as both intoxicating and potentially dangerous, something that lures men away from their ironclad control, which they must always hold onto if they want to stay men. But eros can be good in that it leads to philia, a rational and intimate form of love that's about respect and equality. That's the kind of love we're shooting for. Pausanias calls it heavenly love, which tends to inspire men to turn to the male and delight in him, who is the more valiant and intelligent in nature. Male bodies are considered almost sacred. That's why they spend so much time in gymnasiums getting buff. Being ripped is a way of being a good citizen because the body is a temple. Well, the man's body at least. So when men sexually commune with each other in certain contexts, as long as Phileas, that highest form of love, is involved, is something sacred, too, from which they can both grow and learn. Unlike sex with those beastly ladies. Besides, the gods do it. Zeus, that voracious Lothario, is known to have taken several male lovers. And if that isn't divine, then what is? 
As Aristophanes has it in Plato's Symposium, we were once all part of a greater whole, and when we're born and split from that whole, we're always looking for our other half. Sometimes that other half is the same sex as we are. In this way, men who turn to other men are valiant and manly because they embrace that which is like them. Same-sex relations between men are easy enough to find in ancient Greek writing. To begin, they're almost always between an adolescent boy and an older man. The tradition of pederasty, which means boy love, is a rite of passage that goes back to ancient Greece's tribal beginnings. When a boy neared adulthood, he'd leave civilization and go into the woods with an older man as a rite of passage. That man, called the Erastes, or lover, would guide the Eromenos, or beloved, serving as his mentor and his protector, showing him the ways of the world, and as a reward, gets to play some horizontal love tennis. As time goes on, they stop leaving the city to have these years-long relationships and simply have them at home. A lot of these bonds probably start at the gymnasium, where teenage boys and their older compatriots train to become hoplites or citizen soldiers. I mean, they do all work out in the nude together, which makes it something of a meat market. As Theognis tells us, Happy is the lover who works out naked and goes home to sleep all day with a beautiful boy. In a giant room filled with ripped, exposed abs, it isn't hard to see how such friendships are struck. I can just see them now, hovering by the bench press. Hey, handsome. Wanna go discuss philosophy and, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe bone? But it's important that these relationships aren't just about eros or base desire. They're supposed to be an expression of a deeper, nobler love. To start, the Erastes is supposed to subtly woo the Eromenos with gifts and noble gestures, always under the watchful eye of a trainer or guardian. Young men get flattery and flowers, and we ladies get a marriage contract. Sexy. The youth is supposed to hold off for a while to make sure they're after more than a bedfellow, but will act as a proper friend and mentor. If he agrees, the younger man gets an education and an introduction into society, politics, and the ways of manhood. His mentor might even take him to symposia and to see courtesans to learn the ways of heterosexual loving. Aeschines tells us that many Athenian fathers actually hope their son grows to be good-looking and cause fights between older potential Erastes, as it's sure to help his fortunes and his career down the line. It seems that within these particular confines, the ancient Greeks are just fine with same-sex coupling. They understand sex as an act, not an identity, and they define relationships in terms of who is playing what role. For instance, they don't consider two men being together as a homosexual act because one party, the older guy, is playing the dominant man's role, and the younger one is playing the passive woman's role. In that moment, he's no longer considered a man. It's a perilous position for a young Greek man to be in, as anal sex is often considered disgraceful. That's why, if Greek vases are anything to go by, the Eromenos sometimes performs a different kind of penetration, one that involves essentially rubbing his magic man stick between the boy's thighs to get his jollies. And it's understood that this relationship is a passing thing, a boyhood rite, but not a way to live for the rest of your life. Once your beard grows in and you're considered a man, you've got to leave that older man loving behind you. Sadly, for men who choose to continue on into adulthood, or men of the same age, they find themselves in a much less agreeable social position. Because grown men who turn to men their age for company not only turn their backs on their citizen duties, but turn themselves into a woman. Horrors! Such bonds are even encouraged in the ancient Greek military. In myth, there's the story of the mighty warrior Achilles and his best friend Patroclus, as told in the Iliad, who share a very deep emotional bond. Given that Achilles completely loses his shit after Patroclus dies in battle, many have read that relationship as sexual. Sometimes, all male bands are encouraged to develop romantic relations because it makes them better fighters, more willing to fight and die for each other. As Plato puts it, A handful of such men fighting side by side will defeat the whole world. 
The real-life sacred band of Thebes in the 4th century was made up of 150 pairs of gentlemen lovers, considered better warriors because of the deep bonds they share. They fight well in several battles until Philip II of Macedon gets to them, but even he's impressed with their bravery, so much so that he builds them a monument and says, Perish miserably they who think that these men did or suffered aught disgraceful. Make no mistake, this is not a same-sex utopia, and the kinds of things philosophers have to say about it aren't the same as what's accepted in practice. There are laws that dictate what age the younger boy should be, who's allowed to pair off, and how these relationships should happen. One thing is certain, they aren't meant to last past a certain point. There are punishments for those who refuse to give up homosexual relations outside of society's bounds, and not all Greek cultures are quite so down. In ancient Sparta, says Plutarch, affectionate regard between boys is okay, but there is to be no hugging, because that kind of affection is for the body and not the mind. Men caught embracing risk being deprived of civic rights for life. In Greek myth, Orpheus, the man who goes to the underworld to save his female lover, only to lose her because he's really bad at following directions, decides enough with the ladies and turns his attention to young men. This angers some female followers of the god Dionysus, chief executor of wine and drama. So they dramatically tear the guy apart, throwing his head into the Hebrus River. The lesson, apparently? Even if you're God-blessed, you should stay in your lane. What about lady-loving, you wonder? The truth is that we don't know much about how the ancient Greeks think about it. I mean, it's not like women have sexual urges, say the experts, and they don't have pointy man sticks to duel with. So, romantic love between them can't be a thing. Right. While later historians will claim that all female tribes of Amazon warrior women were lovers of the ladies, the general wisdom on sexuality in ancient Greece doesn't back up the claim. Guys like Plutarch believe that when it comes to attraction, like calls to like. Because Amazons tend to be a bit manly, he says, they're naturally attracted to particularly manly men. And so it's only extremely feminine women who are attracted to other women. I guess ancient dudes didn't think that was worth writing about. But there are other ideas. Take Aristophanes' ideas in Plato's Symposium about how we're all separated halves of a united whole, always trying to find each other. That applies to men attracted to men and women attracted to women. It's not about orientation, but connection. Plato also tells us plainly that some women do not care for men, but have female attachments. Though he gives us no notion of what these look like in practice. Luckily for us, Sappho did, giving us some beautiful glimpses. But until someone invents a real-life time machine or discovers Sappho's long-lost super-secret journal, we're unlikely to ever know whom she loved. We also don't know how she died hopefully peacefully, and surrounded by her favorite lady lovers. It probably won't shock you to know that men started telling tall tales about her demise pretty quickly. A Greek guy called Strabo tries telling everyone that she leapt off the Leucadian Cliff, a place where jilted lovers were known to throw themselves into oblivion over some man. Okay, Strabo. Centuries after her death, Greek comedians started to work her into parodies in which she and other women from Lesbos are painted as oversexed and even whorish. To them, the word lesbian has a whole different and derogatory meaning and nothing to do with same-sex loving. Thanks to them, the Greek verb lesbiazine, which translates to to act like someone from Lesbos, implies the act of blowing on some guy's windmill. Women from Lesbos are happy to sleep with whoever, these comedies suggest. A philosopher named Seneca later complains that some guy wrote this epic manifesto about whether or not Sappho was a prostitute. And in fact, the accounts of her were so widely different that some ancient writers thought there must be two Sapphos, one who wrote great poetry and one who was a notorious sex worker. Because they can't possibly be the same person. The Suda, a 10th century Byzantine encyclopedia, is where we get a lot of her bio, written centuries after Sappho's time. They list her husband as Kerkulos, which, it turns out, is a combination of the Greek slang for penis and the word for man. So they're listing her husband as, I kid you not, Dick of Man, which was probably an ancient joke about her sex life. 
LOL. Why was this the running joke they decided to go with? Because Sappho was too admired and therefore threatening? Or did same-sex desire on the page feel like something they needed to pave over? Regardless of their efforts, she's become a lesbian icon. Most people know her by name, which is crazy considering how little of her work we've discovered. Sappho wrote some 10,000 lines in her lifetime, but today we have only 650 of them. She wrote nine books of poetry, or rather papyrus scrolls, that once circulated widely. A copy was once kept in the Great Library of Alexandria in Egypt, one of the ancient world's most coveted libraries. The scholars there enshrined her into their canon of nine lyric geniuses, the only woman to make the list. It seemed like her work wasn't going anywhere in a hurry. Three centuries after her death, one guy confidently exclaims, The white columns of Sappho's lovely song endure, and will endure, speaking out loud as long as ships sail from the Nile. Given that the great library burned to the ground, I'm pretty sure he jinxed it. Though some people posit that her poems were destroyed because they advocate lady-on-lady -lady action, we can mostly blame the brutal ravages of time. A whole lot of her work, plus some things by Homer and Plato, were actually discovered in Egypt in a place called Oririnchis. It wasn't found in the city itself, but the site of its ancient garbage dump. The ancient world burned often, scrolls were lost or damaged, there was no printing press, no universal server. It's kind of a miracle we have any of her work at all. The rest comes down to misunderstanding and some creative censoring. Remember that lyric poetry was meant to be memorized and recited, not passed down in written form. Plus, she wrote her work in an Aeolic Greek dialect that was hard for Homeric Greek writers to translate, and those lazy bastards were like, Ugh, maybe later. It was all passed down in snippets, probably miscopied by her fans as time went on. One piece of a poem about Aphrodite and her temple, which gives us the lovely line, Where cold water ripples through apple branches, the whole place shadowed in roses, was found scrawled on a bit of broken clay pot. She's always been hard to study, even back in the Byzantine era. Both Sappho and her works, wrote one disappointed scholar, the lyrics and the songs have been trashed by time. Not everyone was a fan of the erotic nature of her work. A saint and a pope both had her works burned. Tatian, the peach, later called her, a sex-crazed whore who sings of her own wantonness. I'm sure there are a few concerned monks mixed in there too, picking out some of the juicier bits. Over time, people continued to struggle to understand Sappho. Even into the 19th and 20th centuries, critics were trying to explain away her overt lesbian eroticism by saying it was entirely innocent. Just admiration, not desire. But her words, even now, are full of emotion that can't be explained away and shouldn't have to be. Sappho's legend has taken on a life of its own. Like a snowball rolling down the hills of time, every successive generation that reads it adds a new layer of meaning. And that's the magical thing about literature. Once it leaves the writer's soul and enters the hands of readers or listeners, it becomes whatever they make it. As to the woman herself, we may never truly know her, how she lived, or whom she loved. But I bet I know what she would say if we could ask her. I don't kiss and tell, but I think we all know I had some sexy adventures. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, consider becoming a patron. It makes all the difference in the world to an indie podcaster like me. You'll be helping to keep the show alive, and you'll get access to exclusive bonus episodes, sneak peeks, behind-the-scenes goodies, and more. Just go to my website and click on Become a Patron. And don't forget to check out the brand new Explores shop where you'll find greeting cards, posters, and other women's histories goodies. 
To check out the lady-centric ancient Greek timeline and map I made you, go to this episode's show notes on my website. There you'll also find a transcript, a list of my research sources, music credits, and lots of pictures. Speaking of pictures, check me out on Instagram at The Explores Podcast, on Facebook, or on Twitter at The Explores Pod. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael B. Levy, who composes all of his work on recreated lyres of antiquity, giving us a special insight into what ancient music might have sounded like. All songs were provided and licensed by AKMProductionsInc.com, and you can find links to his work in the show notes. A special thanks to the following podcast legends who kindly contributed their vocal stylings. Sappho's sultry voice comes courtesy of Tawny Plattis from The Dirty Bits Podcast, which covers the scandalous and salacious bits of history your teacher probably left out. Nathan from Queen's Podcast, who will make you laugh and cry over badass women from history. And Sean from Story of Your and Yours, who reads you classic stories in the most soothing voice you'll ever hear. Their podcasts are some of my very favorites, so check them out. You'll find links to their work in the show notes. Thanks also to the kind friends and family who never fail to delight me with their voiceovers. John Armstrong, Andrew Goldman, Phil Chevalier, Paul Goblonsky, and Simon Denatris. Thanks as always to Paul Goblonsky, aka Mr. Explores, for my theme music and logo, and all the amazing pieces of art we've been collaborating on this season. I'd pick up my Spartan sword for you any day. Mm-hmm.